functional programming for everybody. So if you've heard about functional programming and the new way of doing things, Alan is here to tell us all about it. Thanks, Alan. Sure. Thank you. Can you hear me? All right. So to, to, to kick this off, I mean, I'll be doing a very introductory sort of a session to uh, functional programming in general. All right. So to kick that off, so firstly, I mean, what is functional programming? All right. So functional programming is a, is a programming paradigm in which functions rule the kingdom, as opposed to some like, something like in an OOP language where, uh, you know, um, of course, objects, you know, like as nouns rule the kingdom, right? So what does that mean? So if we look at the imperative languages such as C, Java, Ruby, etc., and so forth, um, you know, you, you have something like, you know, we obviously have a, a, you know, an instance of a car, for instance, in this case. And then we say my car dot drive, right? It's got the dot net notation followed by some method to execute, right? So in functional programming, really what we, what we are looking at is we are, we are looking to put the verb first, right? It's, it's function, it's drive my car, in this case, all right? So, uh, so there's an important difference here to, to immediately notice. The difference is, is that the drive function in this particular case has been decoupled from the object itself. All right. So, so by being de obviously decoupled, it means what are we left over when we take away the behavior? We take away the methods or functions from an object. We are left so with state. That's what's, that's what's left over. All right. So, so, so that's basically that. Um, so what's common? obviously to all functioning programming languages, then is, I mean, this is the property we've just sort of looked at, is separation of state and behavior. All right, that's the first thing. Secondly, functions can be passed around as any other data, thus are basically first class citizens to the language itself. All right, so what happens if we want to take our drive function that we just saw of our car, say class in OOP style, and we want to generalize it a bit. All right. So, so in a typical way, uh, it, it will look something like this. I mean, this is just a bit of Python code. I think it's the closest thing to somewhat pseudocode. So, you know, we don't have to try introduce a new language in 15 minutes. All right. So, class car inherits some vehicle, right? Some generalization of a car. And then we define a drive function that overrides the vehicles drive, um, you know, obviously, um, function, uh, method, okay? So then we call some super to, to be able to invoke that generalized behavior, right? And then this is followed by some car-specific logic that would go in that sort of area where we got the comment. Okay, so in a functional style, we, we could code this, in, I mean, it would be coded in a somewhat different way. Um, so what we would rather have is we would have a drive function, a generalized drive function, okay? That takes in a vehicle, but take note in this case, we're talking about in a functional way, a vehicle is not an object that, remember we said already, we decouple the state and behavior. So when I say vehicle, I'm really talking about only the state of the vehicle, right? The data part. And then it follows by some F parameter, okay? So F in this case is a function representation, okay, that basically will take care of doing some, some specialized size, you know, some specialization of, of the drive functionality itself. So we look at the last line, which is, uh, you know, a, an example here. We say drive my car and then some car extra being passed in as a parameter. Now take note, obviously car extra is a function. It's not, it's not an evaluated function, you know, with a result, you know, it's result, but rather the function itself, unevaluated version of the function. Okay, so, so that's important. So obviously what we've just obviously derived from this is a second property that's common to functional programming languages, and that is the existence of higher order functions, as we, as we call them. Okay, so thirdly, there's no notion of variables. Since values that obviously, uh, you know, uh, since values are actually constants, uh, constants and they do not actually obviously vary. All right, so that's an important difference. I mean, so they do not change. We cannot mutate state in place. All right, so that's key. So, so what does this mean in a typical imperative style? You would say my car dot pause and, you know, and for that position, we would give it some point, like in this case, a, some form of a, a map, um, you know, just representing these three elements, X, Y, and Z, sort of coordinates, okay? So important thing here is that the pause is destructive, isn't it? 
Because what it's doing is it's destroying the existing value of pos in place. All right. Now let's contrast this with a functional cell. In a functional programming setting, we would say my card at pos is still the same way, where it says equals to some, uh, you know, some new value. But take take note on the left hand side. When we change the pos, we receive a new representation of the car object in this case. Okay. So that's a very important thing, and you'll see how obviously linked this, how you know linked this is, or, or, or rather, you know, um, ad advantages to um, concurrent programming and those kind of things. We'll see in a second. So, okay, so so that's our basically third property, and that's the absence of variables, right? In 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 functional programming, I mean, everything is a constant. Okay. So, so then on a final note here in terms of these common properties is that um, lazy evaluation exists that allows for two things. Delayed evaluation of uh, expressions. So when I say expressions, it's the non-literal values. Okay? And the definition of infinite data structures. Okay. So let's touch on both of those. All right. So delayed evaluation means that expressions are evaluated only as per need basis. All right, why are we evaluating everything when we only maybe need to only evaluate certain parts that a compiler could determine need to be obviously evaluated? All right, why are we evaluating everything? That's, that's the question that this raises here. So the, the next point, of course, uh, you know, when we talk about infinite data structures, it's better to look through this example. So I'm gonna, uh, you know, I've, um, my examples might not be the best as sort of analogy here with the use of a car, but let's go with this anyway. So, you, you know, we, we get an idea what we mean by lazy data structure here. So let's say we define a function that's called, you know, let's say, uh, make lazy sequence, okay? And it takes in some function, okay? What is it going to do is, is, is the following. It's going to generalize the lazy sequence, okay? Of, of, of basically, sorry, rather, uh, generate a, a lazy sequence of, of elements, okay? But it's not going to evaluate each one of those elements. So that way we can actually keep the you know, the, 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 the length of the sequence doesn't really matter anymore, does it? You know what I mean? Is, is it could be infinitely long if we, if we don't evaluate it, all right? So here, here is an example. If we read this more like from inside sort of out, like if we look at the, the Mick lazy sequence and let's say that receives a build car um, function. A build car does nothing but let's say construct a, a you know, car instance, okay? You know, just data, you know, okay? And, um, but it's unevaluated. So, so our Mick lazy sequence, even though I haven't shown you the body because it's, it's not enough to do so in this talk, um, it, would, um, you know, it would actually then you know, recursively generate uh, you know, uh, you know, um, basically a sequence of unevaluated, unevaluated elements. Okay. So, so let's look at what this means in this particular case. We're saying, uh, you know, with the Mick lazy sequence for build car, we are basically saying, um, uh, we'll give you, you know, we'll give you the recipe for building a car, okay? And the Merck lazy sequence is going to give us the infinitely long assembly line of vehicles. All right. So let's look at the next function, you know, to, uh, obviously from inside out to, to uh, obviously, which is take. And take says, take that, uh, take, take, the take the 10 elements, you know, from the beginning of the sequence. All right. So, so taking the 10 elements, we're effectively saying, cool, go ahead and evaluate those elements. Okay, so produce, you know, build those cars, all right? And then what we're saying is ship them. So if I obviously have to read this a bit better, as my comment says, it would be basically saying shipping 10 built, uh, you know, built cars taken from the infinite, line, uh, infinite assembly line, all right? Okay, so, so that's our fourth property, and the final one we'll look at today is one of the, uh, you know, the key property, the four key properties that I've, you know, covered today uh, in terms of uh, functional programming, and that's the support for lazy evaluation. It's quite a glare from there. <laughs> wow. Ah. <laughs> Blinded. <laughs> All right. So, 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 what, so, so now that we've covered these four properties, what are the benefits? Of all this, I mean, what's the point? It's great that you tell me we can do all of these things in functional programming, but how's that any different from anything else that we do today in a more maybe imperative style of programming? Event? So one of the important things immediately is the improved testability capability. Thank you. Okay. So by improved testability, think about that. Why is why? How did we manage to improve the testability? Okay. Well, 
If we've removed variables out of the equation, you know, all of a sudden our functions can operate as block boxes in a sense that they do not have to, uh, you know, interact with the outside world, you know, except for the parameters being passed through, you know, formally as, you know, of, of the function itself. And how do they communicate? How do the functions communicate to the outside world? As a return value of a function. Okay. By doing that, I mean, the testability and ability to reason about code just becomes that much more effective. All right. So, and then the next thing is, of course, inherent parallelism and lock-free concurrency. Okay. So, again, it, this is very much linked to, you know, the absence of, of mutability in place. Okay. So, what does that mean? Do we really have to worry about locking things up that if I change the position of a vehicle, that that vehicle is going to give me a new instance of a vehicle? Do I really have to worry about, um, you know, um, if someone's going to, you know, under, you know, behind my back, change the value of that thing? I don't. That's the power there, right? So that's that, you know. So that's that's a big thing, especially in today's world, when it comes down to, of course, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, multi-core uh, support and all of those kind of things and multi-processes and that. So. Of course, the next thing is powerful abstraction mechanism through higher order functions, which we've already seen the ability to be able to pass, to treat functions as first class citizens. So meaning not only to execute them, but pass them around as data, and also to be able to seamlessly combine them using nothing more than uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, the uh, composition operator like what you've seen in the mathematics, where we can combine two functions to, you know, to, to basically then you know, compose this composition and then be able to obviously compute. So, uh, I've got two more things here. So it's a uh, performance, um, you know, increases with the lazy evaluation. So how is this? Well, um, if we can avoid needless computation, right? I mean, if I have a, an assembly line, do I have to evaluate everything? Or can I just say, well, some of the stuff. So we're not just talking about from some framework perspective. We're talking about inherently from a language perspective. This is what to expect in a functional setting, is that if I need to deal with large rate, the data sets, I can just take as, as please, you know what I'm saying, take pieces. So think of it maybe as a one more analogy, as let's say a tap of water, is that if I've got a tap of water and I fill the bucket, what do I do when I'm finished? I close the tap, you know? And that's me consuming the, the stream while I need it, you see? So I'm not evaluating all the water ex that exists, let's say, in the Johannesburg region. region. That would be one way of putting it. Another thing is that, you know, uh, we, you know, the ability to, you know, obviously reason about things mathematically. Now, this is good on three fronts, okay? One is the uh, compiler optimization, okay? So here's the reason. If you've got things that, that you know, that, that are, uh, you know, that are much more predictable because variables just don't just necessarily mutate in place, okay? Then also the compiler has the ability to be able to uh, equationally determine things that a programmer has written that can be rewritten to a more uh, efficient, optimized piece of code. You can do that a lot more effectively than, uh, you know, in a, fu in a functional setting. Okay. So the, the, the next one is obviously co the correctness proof, and that's just obviously the ability, again, for a compiler to be able to tell us, uh, you, know, uh, you know, that this is certainly a lot more correct, or, or rather correct, than, you know, as compared to how it would be, let's say, an imperative setting, where there's a lot of moving parts, and you have to deal with the environment model rather than the substitution model itself. So that brings me on substitution model, which is a very useful thing for a programmer. Uh, if things can't really change outside of my function, then I have the, then I have the ability to be able to, uh, uh, you know, uh, take a piece of paper out of my function, substitute x for whatever x is going to be, and I can work it out on a piece of paper. You can't really do that imperative language because you've got to carry the environment model as well because it's got a lot of outside effects that can take place. And then, um, yeah, just my favorite quote here. And uh, um, the, uh, just to, yeah, almost a, one minute, perfect. And then, um, very nice quote. What I actually thought about last night was, was this little piece I added at the bottom, which is quite interesting, um, is... Um, if you turn this around and you say, well, instead of, uh, you know, hundreds of operations on a single data structure, and you say uh, the other extreme, which is uh, hundreds of data structures, variants, um, you know, that are, uh, well, one, operator, one operation or one function over hundreds of um, uh, data structures, you, you get OOP. So that's quite interesting. So, so, so it's quite a, obviously the idea is not to say you have you know just one data structure with 100 functions, but the idea is if you got if you see it as a moving scale, uh, you know over here if you said 
Um, the way Alan obviously uh, Paul says here, you know, 10 functions on 10 data structures, that's probably the worst case you can get because no paradigm there really fits the bill. So, so my idea here to you is, I'm just saying what I'm trying to convey, is that if we tip the scale slightly towards more operations, it's very suitable for functional side of programming. You tip it more towards more variance, and it suits quite well to the OP style. So this is my closing, really, in, in companies in South Africa. With, I've just got a few up here. We've got uh, Aldo, which um, I've also personally worked on. I mean, we've got a good couple of thousand lines of uh, closure code running there, um, doing some good stuff around automated reading and um, you know, intelligent monitoring around, obviously, um, consumer energy. Pattern match technologies as well. They've done some great stuff in highly scalable uh, you know, financial systems, am I right? And I know Amazon.com as well and Cape Town's doing some good stuff in Scala as well. Um, I know, if, uh, pretty certain actually at this moment, that all three companies are looking for talented guys, so um, I'll be happy to share the slides and that as well, of course. And then um, Lambda Luminaries, uh, of course, is a um, user group, a functional programming user group that you guys are more than welcome to attend. The URL is there and some resources for you guys to take home. If, you, uh, if you're interested in functional programming, you've got some imperative background in programming in, in like, let's say, Java, C, and other languages, um, the, uh, the Martin Odeski's um, uh, course on Coursera, which is free, and it starts on 3rd of September, is amazing. All right. So that's it. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you.